was raised by my dad and my stepmom over not too far from, from the studio here, actually. So I love this area just because I'm a little biased about it, you know. I just grew up knowing the area, you know. A lot of great friends in the area. Yeah. And um, I found uh, some camaraderie and, and going to clubs at a young age and rock and roll clubs here in Atlanta at the time. Uh, a lot of bands came out of Atlanta at the time. And obviously it was the old school guys like Black Crows, Collective Soul and all those guys. And later got to know a lot of those guys and it was great. Longer. But I developed wonderful relationships and those relationships, uh, I had to be mindful because I was doing a lot of drugs and I was doing a lot of drinking. And I got clean and I tried to get clean several times. My parents tried to help me and um, because I never felt like I belonged to anything, I had that hole that addicts like to talk about and it's true you know the, the hole that it gets filled by alcohol and drugs and girls or anything else that if you're not doing drugs and drinking then what's left uh, you're gonna get fill that hole with I don't know whatever buying things or girls or music helps but I didn't quite fill it up yeah. finally I finally got clean and I was doing better in music and part of the reason I got clean was because I had uh, an opportunity with music and I really drank it right away and um, it went away <laughs> um, and then I, I was going on about life, just kind of going through with the music stuff and seeing what happened. And I started getting a little more success, getting into some of these uh, healthier crowds with music guys that were already succeeding. And, but I still was missing something. And, and while I was you know, doing everything, you th you know, had every, all the right tools, all the right people around me, and I was doing some of the right stuff, um, I was still kind of floating through. And, um, one band I was in, we did okay, and then that ended and because of someone else's drug problems. <laughs> it seems like a theme in that world. Um, and then one of the guys that was my roommate, um, a guy named Rick, who actually knew Butch Walker and all these other guys, um, uh, my buddy JJ in L.A. had moved back to Atlanta, and uh, he moved in with me. And he, he was a junkie, you know. And, um, and he would drink and stuff, like normal, but if he shot dope, that was where his line was, you know, he couldn't do that. Um, came home one night after a typical, you know, musician's night out, hanging out with some friends, going to the strip clubs and time dating dancers. <laughs> Rick was, was on my couch just hanging out home from the road and, and he was kind of passed on the couch. It was late, like three in the morning. I don't know how I used to stay up so late. <laughs> and uh, now that I'm older. And uh, so he was, uh, it was messy. I was always very, so it turns out I, I, I realized that um, I woke up my roommate, who was also in the music business at the time. She was booking a big festival here called 99X on the Bricks. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I woke her up and I said, you know, Rick's not waking up. And I'm irritated because I wanted to just chill out on my couch. Um, anyway, so she touched him and he was, she, she realized he was cold. And I didn't, I couldn't register what that meant for me. Um, and then I saw the, um, the blood from the from the arm, you know, from the needle. And one thing about Rick is later I found out through JJ, my buddy JJ and other people, that Rick was never a guy to, he was scared of needles, and he never shot himself up. So he had someone shoot him up. So someone was in my house, saw him turn blue and left. Later we found out who that guy was. Ironically, that guy actually uh, passed away about a year and a half ago. Did what they needed to do, and they just told me it was, he had been there, it had been too long, you know. Of course I didn't know that. Um, and um, so that moment was very interesting for me, and I didn't realize at the time for a couple of reasons. One, going through such a, it was really a trauma for me. But you know, friends later said, you know, Rick probably wanted you to find him because I was also in that space, in that time in my life, focused on music, not having knowing what yoga was yet. And also, I was in this place where I was, I was in a dark place really myself. And, Interestingly enough, that week I was debating on whether to go back out and relapse, find some cocaine and some alcohol, which is not a problem to find in any city, let alone Atlanta. And uh, my buddy, who was in, he was the Marvelous Four and the Marvelous Three, and he came over. He had known Rick for all those years and um, was helping with this, Rick's stuff. And, and JJ's open about this. So JJ was also a needle user, he was a junkie. So they used to all shoot up together in, in Los Angeles. <laughs> And so J.J. goes, well, f before uh, Rick's family comes over, I'll go find through the needles and try to find where he would hide the needles because I know him and I know where he'd hide them. Um, didn't find any or found me. Maybe he found one. I don't know. But um, so he did that. And then it brought me and J.J. really close. And like I said, J.J. was somebody I looked up to in the music world. And so J.J. started work with me a little bit. And I got to record a little bit with him and, and uh, uh, a guy named Rusty Cobb. And 
who became later him and Butch, very successful producers and engineers, and and uh, I just thought I was like, oh man, I'm you know, this is cool, you know, I'm I'm doing this, and all this time it's very near after this happened with Rick and these guys would um, we'd all go hang out at Smithville Bar, which is our hangout. Half of us worked there half the time and uh, bartending or bouncing or handling money and. Um, it was the rock and roll place at the time, and it was just the place to go to. And um, everybody was hanging out there, man. It was great. It was, you know, you look back on some of that stuff, and you're watching the sunrise through the through the windows at like four or five, well, five or six in the morning. You're like, oh my god, we've been here since like eleven o'clock last night. And some of those who worked there, and then others just hanging out. It's like, oh my god, we gotta go home. And uh, how many nights we'd all rise, see the sunrise through the windows were interesting. And that place is still there, running strong. I love it. Um, so I have a special kinship with it. Um, and those guys at the time, they would sit to the there. Yoga studio to to this studio and get help and, and and connect with themselves, their bodies, and so to wrap it up, that night that my friend died and my other friends started taking me to yoga to help me escape, I guess, or to do some all they knew how to do with me. Um, little did I know that particular night would lead me to this day which I got to carry the torch for the studio, Still Hot Yoga and Decatur, formerly or Bikram Yoga Decatur, um, and to be a part of this wonderful community. We have uh, my buddy Tuck from the Van Biters. He comes here, Greg Lee and Nicole, and now teaching here, her husband Greg Lee, he's in the Yacht Rock. He comes here, other musicians, and, and obviously all walks of life in the community, the neighborhood people, and I am in awe of where some of my life is right now, knowing that I have other places to continue to go. And I had no idea that I would um, own a studio, be a teacher, continue to be sober, and I still get to do music on some level with great friendships and relationships in the music world. And it is just amazing. And uh, that full circle from that one night has brought me here.